This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. On this episode, we're going to take it back, way back in time. Once Upon a Crime hasn't gone this far back since the Jesse Pomeroy episode. This time, we'll talk about a horrible crime that happened on Christmas Eve Day in 1881. This is Chapter 1 of our new series, Holiday Homicides, The Ashland Tragedy. I hope you'll grab a cup of eggnog or some hot apple cider and join me for this holiday true crime tale. This episode is brought to you by Audible. Once Upon a Crime listeners can get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial just by going to audibletrial.com slash onceuponacrime. If you like historical true crime, you'll probably like episode 5 of Once Upon a Crime, where I detailed the Jesse Pomeroy case from 1872. Audible has a great book you can download for free when you sign up. I loved it, and it was the reason I covered the Jesse Pomeroy case on the podcast. The book is called The Wilderness of Ruin, A Tale of Madness, Fire, and the Hunt for America's Youngest Serial Killer, by Roseanne Montillo. You can download that book or one of the 180,000 other audiobooks they have to choose from for free and get a 30-day free trial by going to audibletrial.com slash onceuponacrime. Ashland, Kentucky in 1881 was a small city situated on the Ohio River in northeast Kentucky, not far from the Ohio border. In the 1880s, it was growing into an industrial town, with its principal industry being coal and iron ore. Some notable people who hail from the Ashland area include Billy Ray Cyrus, Naomi and Winona Judd, Lindy England, a former Army Reserve soldier made famous by the Abu Ghraib scandal, and the cult leader Charles Manson. In Ashland in 1881, the Gibbons family was well known in the community. The patriarch of the family, John Gibbons, often traveled to other parts for work. He was sometimes gone for weeks at a time. He and his wife, Martha Gibbons, weren't on the best of terms, as you'll learn later. And this was probably for the best. There were three children living in the home at that time. The oldest, Robert, called Bobby, was 17 years old. The middle child was Fanny, 14 years old. And the youngest was Sterling, 11. Robert had lost a leg a few years earlier when he'd had an accident falling in front of and under an empty rail car that was being pulled alongside the tracks at the Norton Iron Works. Fanny was a popular girl. She was said to be outgoing and cheerful and had many friends. She was also reportedly an attractive girl who looked older than her 14 years. On December 23, 1881, at about 6 p.m., Martha Gibbons had stopped by the home of her neighbor, who lived across the street, Mrs. Thomas. Mrs. Gibbons was taking her youngest child, Sterling, to visit a relative in Ironton, Ohio, just across the river. She wondered if Mrs. Thomas's daughter, Emma, might spend the night with Fanny and Bobby. As Bobby was an invalid and Mr. Gibbons was away, she thought it would be helpful to have Mrs. Thomas's daughter, who was 15, over to help Emma with things, and also to keep her and Bobby company. Emma and Fanny were friends and enjoyed spending time together. Mrs. Thomas agreed, and Emma soon grabbed her coat and headed over to the Gibbons' home. One detail I'll mention quickly. Emma's last name was actually Carrico. She was a child from a previous relationship Mrs. Thomas had before she met and married her current husband. To make it easier to follow, I'll refer to her as Emma Thomas, as she is sometimes called in newspaper accounts. The neighbors reported hearing the children talking and laughing throughout the evening. No other noise was reported, although in the very late or very early hours of Christmas Eve day, a terrible atrocity took place in the Gibbons' home. Across the street, Mrs. Thomas woke up around 4 a.m. and began her morning chores. She glanced out the window to the Gibbons' home and saw nothing unusual. A little after 6 a.m., she looked over again and thought she saw an unnatural light flickering in the window of the house. After a minute or two, she realized it was a fire she was seeing. The Gibbons' home was on fire. She ran across the street yelling, Help! Fire! The neighbors were alerted and the fire department called. A large section of the house was engulfed in flames, but the firefighters were informed that there were children in the house. They fought their way through the flames, where they found three bodies and dragged them outside. They were very clearly deceased. Their bodies were badly burned, but a physician was called to make a determination of death. 
and the townspeople were shocked to find out that this was no ordinary house fire that had caused the children's deaths. No, all three had their skulls smashed, which was determined to be the cause of death. It was also discovered that the two young girls had been brutally raped. The fire, it was believed, had been set to cover up the crime. The people were shocked and outraged that something so brutal and terrible could happen in their town, and on the day everyone was preparing to celebrate the Christmas holiday was unthinkable. There was rumor and speculation about who could have done such a thing. The people didn't feel safe until the murderer or murderers were caught. Back at the crime scene, the investigators were trying to piece together what happened. Bloody sheets and pillows were found as well as an axe and a crowbar, both covered in blood. These were taken into evidence, as were the children's bedclothing. They had nothing else to go on, no witnesses, no one had heard or seen a thing. That afternoon, the mayor, John Means, called a meeting to raise money for a reward and to hire detectives to find the culprit. In those days, private detectives were often called in to assist in solving crimes that the citizens didn't think the police were equipped to handle. The reward money grew to over $1,000, or $22,000 in today's dollars. Some accounts report that the amount was closer to $3,000. Whatever the case, with this amount of money for the taking, private detectives from the neighboring areas came in droves. One of these detectives, J.B. Morris from Ohio, quickly surmised that the father, John Gibbons, was guilty of the crime. News reports began to name Mr. Gibbons as a suspect. At this time, he still had not been located or informed of the crime. While it was strange that Gibbons was considered a suspect before he was even located or an alibi established for him, it was perhaps not so strange given what Mrs. Gibbons had been saying to the media. In the December 29th edition of the Chicago Tribune, Detective Norris is quoted as saying, J.W. Gibbons is suspected of murdering his two children and a friend. He has not been heard from and is suspected to have committed suicide. More fuel was certainly added to this speculation by the words of his own wife. Mrs. Gibbons is quoted as saying that her husband was subject to spells of temporary insanity or at least frequently acted like a lunatic. She went on to say that he frequently threatened to burn the house and kill his family by cutting their heads with a hatchet. She said he told her that he wished, quote, she and he were both in hell and that he was heaping coals on her. She said she lived in constant dread of her husband for years, fearing that he would murder her. She also claimed that the children were afraid of their father. She was quoted as saying, he was so stern that when the children were sitting around the fire, they would talk in whispers for fear of their father. Finally, she stated that he had threatened to drown himself in the pond. The authorities now decided to drag the pond for his body. The article concluded by saying that when Mr. Gibbons had money, he was in good humor. He boasted of his good wife and having the best children in the world. But when he was broke, he would get so violent that he was considered dangerous. Obviously, there had been bad blood between husband and wife, and now his wife jumped to add teeth to Detective Norris's belief in her husband's guilt. On December 31st, John Gibbons was located in Hamlin, West Virginia. Deputy U.S. Marshal Heflin of Maysville tracked him down and broke the news of the tragedy. Devastated, he rode back with the marshal and was quickly exonerated when it was proven he had been in West Virginia the entire time. Detective Norris left in humiliation. Marshal Heflin took over the case. A few days later, a man named George Ellis walked into the general store to buy a cigar. The storekeeper, Mr. Powell, waited on him, and while he was ringing up his purchase, made conversation about the Gibbons tragedy. Well, now that old man Gibbons is in the clear, he said, I wonder who it is going to fall on now. At this, Powell later reported, Ellis grew pale and began to tremble. He then blurted out about having a clue who it might be, and murmured something about state's evidence, and left the store. Accounts vary as to what happened next. Marshal Heflin was staying and working out of the Aldine Hotel. Some reports say that Ellis walked into the hotel himself and asked to speak with the marshal, as he had something to get off of his chest. Some reports say that the shopkeeper, seeing Ellis behaving suspiciously, reported this to Heflin, who ordered Ellis to come and see him. Either way, Ellis and Heflin had a meeting. Once together, Ellis told him he might have something to say, but first asked him to explain the meaning of the term state's evidence. Heflin explained that anyone guilty of a crime could inform on others involved in this crime, 
and they would likely get a lesser sentence than the other guilty party. With that, Ellis told the following account. George Ellis was a bricklayer. He was also a neighbor of the Gibbons family. He had two co-workers named William, or Bill, Neal, and Ellis Kraft. A few days before the murders, Ellis said he met Kraft, who told him he was going to see Fanny Gibbons, bring her some candy, and was going to have intercourse with her. He wanted Ellis to come with him. Around midnight on the night in question, Ellis Kraft and also William Neal went to the Gibbons' home. He said Kraft raised the window with an old axe and went in first. Neal followed. But Ellis said he stayed behind on the porch and afterwards went in as well. Bobby was the first to awaken and started to get up. Kraft told him he'd better lie still. Kraft, Ellis says, then went to the bed where the two girls were sleeping and began to take improper liberties with them. When Bobby saw what was happening, he yelled for Kraft to stop and tried to get up, but was unable to confront him physically with only one leg. At Bobby's interference, Kraft hit him with the axe. The girls screamed, and Kraft jumped on the bed toward them. Emma tried to leap from the bed, but Neil, who Ellis claims, had come to rape Emma while Kraft was after Fanny, attacked her. He choked her and knocked her to the floor. She fought him, and Ellis held her down, while Neil, quote, outraged her. Neil then hit her on the head with the big end of the crowbar. Kraft called out for Ellis to help him hold Fanny while he raped her. Ellis did as asked. Afterwards, he says, Kraft hit her with the axe as well. Neil proposed making sure the girls were dead, which they did, hitting them multiple times with the axe. To cover the crime, Ellis said he took some coal oil, which he poured over the bodies, setting fire to them, and then leaving the house. Ellis said that the three men had been talking about the matter for several months while they worked together in the brickyard. One day, Emma Thomas had passed by, and Neil swore that he would have carnal communication with her before Christmas. Kraft made similar statements about Fanny Gibbons. Kraft and Neil were located and arrested and taken to the county jail in Catlettsburg, about five miles away. Strangely, they were placed in the same cell as Ellis. The next morning, unsurprisingly, Ellis recanted his confession, but it was too late. Rumor had it that three men had been arrested and jailed. A mob began to form at Ashland and plans were made to storm the jail and seize the prisoners. Officials grew alarmed and decided to send the prisoners to Lexington, Kentucky, for their own safety. They were placed on the Catlettsburg Ferry and set off down the river, but the mob heard about the transfer and started in pursuit in another steamboat. A chase ensued, but the officers were able to outrun the mob and deliver the men to Lexington. A few reporters were allowed to board the boat and speak to the prisoners. Kraft and Neil were shackled together and seemed to be in good spirits, joking and laughing with the reporters. They both proclaimed their innocence and believed they'd soon be freed when the truth came out. Ellis was chained away from them and remained silent. An officer who was guarding the men on the ferry reportedly overheard the men talking. He said that Neil spoke to Ellis, saying, I don't think you have got very long to live, and I guess we might as well talk. Ellis, how can you give me away like this and ruin my life and my little children's? If they hang me, they hang an innocent man. Ellis allegedly replied, Boys, you know we were there. I would not tell a lie and meet my God for 10,000 worlds. At the jail in Lexington, Ellis again made a statement calling his first statement false. He said he had been coerced by Marshal Heflin to confess at gunpoint. On January 16th, Neil and Kraft were put on trial. Neil was tried first for the murder of Emma Thomas. There were several conflicting testimonies, with some saying Neil was miles away that day, and others saying that they saw him only 50 feet from the burning home. There was no physical evidence presented. Then George Ellis took the stand. He was calm and collected as he gave his account. He said that Kraft and Neil had come to his house on the 23rd while he was in bed and said to come with them. So he got dressed and followed them. When asked where they were going, they said, to the Gibbons' house to have some fun. When Ellis said he wouldn't go, they pulled a gun on him. The account he told was almost the same as the original account, but now he said that they got to the girls first and put their hands over their mouths. When Bobby heard this, he woke. He said Kraft had already choked Fanny into unconsciousness and then left her to subdue Bobby. As before, he stated that Neil attacked and killed Emma, while Kraft did the same to Fanny. 
He only helped hold the girls down when told to. Afterwards, Kraft said to him, You have done none of the killing, but you must have a hand in it, and ordered him to get the coal oil and pour it over the girls. Kraft lit the fire, and then they left. It was about 3 a.m. When the fire was discovered, the three of them were in front of the house with the other neighbors. Then they went for a walk in the cemetery. The cemetery is located about a half mile from the Gibbons' house. There they told Ellis he must sign a pledge never to talk about it. He said he'd think about it. He was told if he didn't sign a pledge by that following Saturday, they would put an end to him. Mrs. Ellis was called to testify and stated that she awoke twice that evening, once at midnight and at 4.30 a.m., and both times her husband was home. This, of course, conflicted with Ellis's own testimony. Character witnesses were called for Neil. Mrs. Neal was called. She cried and said he was a good husband and father to their young children. On February 6, 1882, after only 17 minutes of deliberation, the jury found Neal guilty and sentenced him to hang on February 14th. A few days later, Kraft was also convicted on the same evidence and was sentenced to hang on the same date. George Ellis would confess and recant several times. At one point, he made a statement to a local paper. He said that he and two Negroes he had hired had committed the murders. Later that night, he had seen Kraft and Neal walking down the street and decided to blame them for the crime. Ellis's whole initial confession is problematic. He paints himself out to be like an innocent lamb to the slaughter. Kraft told him, in effect, that he planned to rape Fanny, but Ellis just went with him when told and did what Kraft and Neal demanded of him, without too much of an argument. Unless Ellis was a very simple-minded person who was easily influenced, this seems hard to believe. And there wasn't any testimony that suggested that. By all accounts, he seemed to be a normal working man who had had no prior trouble with the law or anyone else. But Ellis did very clearly have a guilty conscience, and it didn't take him long to give himself up. Why he would implicate two other men, if they in fact had nothing to do with it, is baffling, and the town was divided about who they believed, Ellis or Neil and Kraft. In May, Ellis was finally sent back from Lexington to stand trial. This time, deliberations lasted 22 hours. On Friday, June 2, 1882, he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. But the town was not happy with this lighter sentence for the only person who admitted to the crime. That same night, a group of 20 men with black hoods covering their faces descended on the Chatteroy Railroad in Ashland and ordered the watchmen to hitch up two flat cars, which they then took to Catlettsburg. They arrived at the jail at 3 a.m. and demanded to be admitted. They were, of course, refused. They stormed the jail, found Ellis, and led him out. Ellis seemed to offer no resistance. He was taken by the rail car five miles away back to Ashland. Once they arrived at their destination, Ellis was asked if he had any statement to make. He said nothing. The statement I made in court was true. The other two are guilty. So am I. Not to the actual murder, but enough. I deserve to die. When asked if he wanted to pray, he replied, No, I have made all the preparations I can, and I'm ready. He was then pulled up off the ground and allowed to hang for some time, and then let down still alive. When he'd recovered from the near hanging, he cried, Oh, why didn't you let me hang? He was asked, Is there anything you have not told? No, he answered. Let me hang this time. He was then hung up again until he was dead. George Ellis was hung from a sycamore tree that stood about a hundred yards from the Gibbons burned home. The body of George Ellis was left hanging in the tree until the following day, when it was cut down by the coroner. The death was ruled to be caused by a person or persons unknown. Kraft and Neal still maintained their innocence and on appeal won a new trial. Many people believed them to be innocent. There was no physical evidence that they were involved, and besides the testimony of Ellis, who many considered to be deranged, what proof was there? They had already won several execution stays and their appeal and were becoming true crime celebrities. They received offers to tell their story on lecture tours if they secured their release. They were frequently interviewed by newspapers whose readers were hungry for details in this ongoing sensational story. As an aside, one reason for this interest is possibly found in the pictures of the accused. Of course, there are no photographs, but there are pretty detailed drawings of the two men. You can find one of them in the show notes or by going to the Instagram account 
at Once Upon a Crime Pod. William Neal is young and is a pretty good-looking dude. One description of Neal says that he looks younger than his 36 years, with light brown hair and a dark mustache. If he looked younger than 36, that's probably because the information I found lists him as 24 years old. He kind of looks like a young Clint Eastwood. Kraft was the oldest at 30 years old. Kraft is the only one of the three said to have a criminal record. It is reported that they were for minor offenses, but he was considered an unsavory character before the murders. It seems half of the populace believed them to be guilty and were just waiting for the day of their hanging, while the other half believed them to be innocent and that Ellis was the real perpetrator and just spread the blame to include the other men. Their guilt or innocence would be debated in the newspapers as well as by the residents of Ashland. In any case, with all the stays and appeals, the case dragged on until the trial was finally set for the fall of 1882. They were sent to Catlitzburg under the guard of five companies of state militia. The governor wasn't taking any chances this time. He even threatened that, if need be, he would kill every person in Boyd County to uphold the law. Mob violence was not going to be tolerated on his watch. The citizens were outraged and said he was treating them more like criminals than the alleged murderers. They burned the governor in effigy in protest. The trial began, but the defense quickly filed for a change of venue. The court granted it and the trial was moved to nearby Carter County, with the trial now scheduled to begin in February 1883. The prisoners were to be sent back to Lexington to await trial. The people of Ashland became increasingly frustrated and wanted justice to be served. The major who was in charge of the militia that was guarding the prisoners during the transfer got wind that a mob was forming and that their intent was to make use, once again, of the sycamore tree they had hung Alice from. The major decided it was too risky to transport them by rail as it traveled directly through Ashland. Instead, he commandeered a steamer boat, the Granite State, to take them up the river to Maysville. But as the steamer was being loaded, a freight car carrying 200 armed men arrived and demanded that the prisoners be handed over to them. The major refused, and the boat shoved off. What happened next was the stuff of Sunday morning television westerns, except this wasn't the West. The mob reboarded the train which ran alongside the river. They fired upon the steamer all the way up the river until it reached Ashland. The militia didn't return fire. When they both reached Ashland, about 20 men from the mob took over a ferry boat and used it to try and intercept the steamer. As it gained on the Granite State, a few men from the mob fired on it. Troops were lined up along the decks of the steamer and opened fire on the vigilantes. The men on the ferry seemed to finally realize how outgunned they were and dove for cover as round after round was fired at them. But as the steamer was close to the dock and the railroad station, where not only was there the remaining men from the mob, but dozens of people who had come to witness the confrontation, the bullets found unintended targets. Killed in the melee was Colonel Reppert, who had earlier tried to stop the mob from boarding the ferry. George Keener, a young father, 14-year-old Willie Sari, and 25-year-old Alexander Harris. Among the injured was James McDonald, who was the brother-in-law of the murdered Gibbons children. He had been shot three times, but would survive. A woman, Mrs. Butler, was shot in the thigh as she sat at the train depot. The steamer then continued on down to its final destination of Maysville. An inquest was conducted later into the incident, but the actions of the militia was ruled justifiable. In February 1883, Kraft's trial was held in Grayson, located in Carter County, about 30 miles away from Ashland. Ten divisions of state militia were camped outside of town to guard the proceedings in shifts. This was in the bitter cold of winter, and the conditions were extremely harsh. They were camped in mud, sleet, and snow. Several of the men were hospitalized, and one trooper would die of exposure. The trial went off without incident. On Saturday, February 24th, after 21 minutes of deliberation, the jury returned the verdict of guilty. Kraft made a statement. I can say one thing. I am not guilty of this charge. I consider that I have not had a fair trial, for I know I am not guilty. I never as much laid my hand on them. You might as well take a little innocent child and hang them as to hang me. I did not see the house or George Ellis or Bill Nill or any of the children that night. The last time I saw any of Mrs. Gibbons' children was on the Wednesday before. I saw little Fanny and I spoke to her. 
That was the last time. I could stand on a scaffold and hold my hand up and swear in the sight of heaven that I did not see those children, Neil or Ellis, that night. I am as innocent as the angels of that thing. During his speech, Mrs. Gibbons cried out, wailing, Oh, my dear children, if they were only here now. Frustrated by the interruption, Kraft ended his speech. Kraft's execution date was set for May 4th, but Governor Blackburn refused to confirm the date, not wanting the execution to be on his conscience, and the execution was delayed until after his term ended. The incoming governor, Governor Knott, set the date for October 12, 1883. On that date, a crowd of approximately 3,000 came to see the hanging. The gallows had been constructed in the same field the troops had encamped the previous February under such harsh conditions. Kraft wanted to walk to the gallows, but was driven by Buggy under heavy guard. He looked calm but anxious as he ascended the stairs to face the hangman's noose. Kraft began a long speech in which he once again asserted his innocence. He sang a hymn and said a prayer. He then stepped on the trap and cried, Lord, receive my soul, and the trap was released. Neil was tried next. On April 30, 1884, was once again found guilty and sentenced to die. He was sent to Mount Sterling, Kentucky, to await his execution. After many appeals, he was finally sent to the gallows on March 3, 1885. He traveled by train to Grayson to ascend the same scaffold Kraft had a year and a half before. On the train platform, he made a short speech to the crowd who'd gathered. Farewell, good people. I hope to meet you in heaven. He called Ellis a lunatic, who swore lies against him and said, It's a fearful thing to walk upon the gallows and die for a crime I did not commit. He swore he'd be proven innocent someday. But at the last hour, his execution was once again postponed. Three weeks later, he was once again brought to Grayson for the execution, and this time there were no more postponements. Neil ate a last meal of eggs, bacon, and coffee, and at one o'clock, he was taken to the gallows escorted by 100 guards. A crowd of over 3,000 was on hand to witness the hanging. This time, Neil made his final statement from the platform. My friends, I say to one and all, you all know this is not the place to tell a lie. I stand here today to suffer for a heinous crime I did not commit. One day my innocence will be established beyond a doubt. I bid you one and all goodbye. O Lord, Thou knowest I am innocent. Into Thy hands I commit my soul. I am innocent. These last words were said as a drop fell. Ten minutes later, Neil was pronounced dead. So ended the sad tale of the Ashland tragedy. What began on an early Christmas Eve morning ended over three years later on the gallows. But it really didn't end there. The tragic story of that Christmas in 1881 continued to be retold by generations in and around Ashland, Kentucky, and became the stuff of songs, poems, and regional true crime lore. The corner of 28th Street and Carter Avenue in Ashland, Kentucky, where the Gibbons' home stood, is still a rural neighborhood of small two-story clapboard homes. It's easy to imagine the Gibbons' children sleeping peacefully on that long-ago cold December night. It would have been a quiet evening with anticipation in the air of the Christmas holiday, dawning just a few hours in the future. But someone, most likely more than one person, had other ideas in mind and set out to brutally attack and murder three innocent children. But was it Ellis, Kraft, and Neil? Most believe that Ellis was definitely involved, as well as at least one accomplice, it's unlikely at least one of the girls wouldn't have been able to escape if there was only one attacker. But whether that accomplice was indeed Neil and or Kraft has been debated for over 130 years. The children were buried together in sections 4 and 5 of the Ashland Cemetery. Memorials are still created in their name, including several ballads. While I couldn't find a recording of one to play for you, and you really don't want to hear me sing it to you, Here's a recitation of one that dates back to the 1940s. I picked this one out of several, as it is not as graphically gory as some of the earlier versions. One Christmas morn in 81, Ashland, Kentucky, that quiet burg, was startled the day had not yet dawned, when a cry of fire was heard. For well they knew two fair ladies had there retired to bed. The startled crowd broke in, alas, 
to find the girls both dead. And from the hissing, seething flames, three bodies did rescue. Poor Emma's and poor Fanny's both, and likewise Bobby's too. And then, like Rachel cried of old, the bravest hearts gave vent. And all that blessed holiday, to heaven their prayers were sent. Autopsy by the doctor showed the vilest of all sin, and proved to all beyond a doubt their skulls had been drove in. And other crimes too vile to name, I'll tell it if I must. A crime that shocks all common sense, a greed of hellish lust. An axe and crowbar there were found, besmeared with blood and hair, which proved conclusively to all what had transpired there. Two virgin ladies of fourteen, the flower of that town, with all their beauty and fond hopes, by demons there cut down. Just blooming into womanhood, so lovely and so true, bright hopes of long and happy days, with morals fast and pure. Then Marshal Heflin sallied forth, was scarcely known to fail, and in ten days had the assassins all safely placed in jail. George Ellis, William Neal, and Kraft, some were Kentucky sons, near neighbors to the Gibbons house, and were the guilty ones. In this here dark and bloody ground, they were true types indeed, of many demons dead and damned, who fostered that same greed. A hellish greed of lust to blast the virtuous and fair, to gratify that vain desire no human life would spare. There Emma Thomas lay in gore, a frightful sight to view. Poor Fanny Gibbons in a crisp, and Bob her brother too. Bob was a poor, lame, crippled boy, beloved by everyone. His mother's hope, his sister's joy, a kind, obedient son. At that dread sight, the mother's grief, no mortal tongue can tell. A broken heart, an addled brain, when all should have been well. Both her dear children laying there, who once so merry laughed. There stiff and stark in death they lay, cut down by Ella's craft. That dreadful demon, imp of hell, consider well his crime. Although he was a preacher's son, has blackened the foot of time. There's a sad moral to this tale. Now pass the word around. Pull off your shoes now and walk light. Ashland is holy ground. Bill Neal, he came from Virginia, a grand and noble state. But his associates were bad, and he has shared their fate. Bill Neal, he saw Miss Emma Thomas so beautiful and fair that all his hellish greed of lust seemed to be centered there. Bill Neal, he was a married man, had children and a wife, and oft times bragged what he would do if it should cost his life. Bill Neal done what he said he would, and yet a greater sin. Then with a great big huge crowbar, broke Emma's skull bones in. Yes, Bill Neal done just what he said, and yet that greater sin, for which the gates of heaven's closed, and will not let him in. Now while his victim is in heaven, where all things are done well, there with the angels glorified, Bill Neal will go to hell. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Our production assistant is Nancy Chen, and our research assistants are Sarah Villarreal and Sabrina Atkinson. You can find links on the show page at truecrimepodcast.com. And you can connect with me on Twitter at Upon a Crime and on Facebook and Instagram at Once Upon a Crime Pod. And we have a new fan page on Facebook, so check it out. Until next time, be good to one another and happy holidays. <laughs>